Narayanam namaskritcham Naram Cheva Narutamam Deving Sarsim Vyasam Tutojaya Mudirayat Nasta Praishu Badreshu Nityang Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavad Yutama Shloke Bhakti Bhavati Naishtiki Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam Translation and commentary by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Srila Prabhupada Ki Reading today from Canto 11, Chapter 7 Text number 52. Nati Sneha Prasangaha Kartavya Kwa api kainajit kurvan vindeta santapam kapotaha iva dinadihi nati sneha prasangova katavyakwa pikainajit Kurvan Vindeta Santapang Kapota Ivadina Dihi Nati Sneha Prasangova Kata Vyakwa Pikena Chit Kurvan Vindeta Santapang Kapota Ivadina Dihi Nati Sneha Prasangova Kata Vyakwa Pikena Chit Kurvan Vindeta Santapang Kapota Ivadina Dihi Nati Sneha Prasangova Kata Vyakwa Pikena Chit Kurvan Vindeta Santapang Kapota Ivadina Dihi Nati Sneha Prasangova Kata Vyakwa Pikena Chit Kurvan Vindeta Santapang Kavota Eva Dina Dihi Nati Sneha Prasangova Kata Vyakwa Pikena Chit Kurvan Vindeta Santapang Kapota Eva Dina Dihi Nati Sneha Prasangova Kata Vyakwa Pikena Chit Kurvan Vindeta Santapang Kapota Eva Dina Dihi Ladies, please. Nati Sneha Prasangova Katavya Kava Pikena Chit 
Kurvan Vindaita Santapang Kapota Ivadi Nadihi Na not Atisnayaha Excessive affection Prasangaha Close association Va or Kartavya one should manifest kwa api ever kainachit with anyone or anything kurvan so doing vindeta one will experience santapam great distress kapotaha the pigeon eva just just as Dina Dihi cripple minded Translation One should never one should never indulge in excessive affection or concern for anyone or anything. Otherwise, one will have to experience great suffering just like the foolish pigeon. Please repeat. One should never indulge in excessive affection or concern for anyone or anything. Otherwise, one will have to experience Great suffering, just like the foolish pigeon. Translation, uh, sorry, purport by Srila Prabhupada. Jai Srila Prabhupada, thank you. The prefix, the Sanskrit prefix, ati, or excessive, indicates affection or attachment in which there is no Krishna consciousness. Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 5, verse 29, Suridang Sarvabhutanang, the Lord is the eternal well-wisher of every living being. The Lord is so affectionate that he sits in the heart of every conditioned soul and accompanies him throughout his endless wandering in the kingdom of Maya, patiently waiting for the conditioned soul to come back home, back to Godhead. Thus the Lord makes all arrangements for the eternal happiness of every living entity. The best way for anyone to show compassion and affection for all living beings is to become a preacher on behalf of Lord Krishna and assist the Lord in reclaiming the fallen souls. If our affection or attachment for others is based on bodily sense gratification in the name of society, friendship and love, then ex that excessive, unwanted affection, ati sneha, will cause burning pain at the time of breaking or destruction of that relationship. Now the story of the foolish pigeon will be narrated. A similar story is described in the seventh canto, second chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, told by Yamaraj to the mourning widows of King Suyagya. Nati snehak prasangova kata vyak kwa pikena chit kurvan vindeta santapang kapoti ivadina dihi. One should never indulge in excessive affection or concern for anyone or anything. Otherwise, one will have to experience great suffering just like the foolish pigeon. Omagyana Timarandasya Janandana Shalakaya Chakshura Militang Jaina Tazmai Shi Gurave Namaha Vanchakalpa Turubiascha Kripa Sindhu Bhavicha Patita Nam Pavanibio Vaishnavebio Namo Namaha Jai Shi Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shi Advaita Gadata Shivasti Gaurabhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari Hari 
हरि राम हरि राम 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 हरि हरि This chapter is as we know telling the story of the avaduta who is able to learn lessons from nature it raises the question of whether we're going to <laughs> by experience whether we can get the right lesson uh even we're going to hear a story now it's it's one of those heavy stories uh about the nature of the material world but it's important to understand scripture and stories properly hmm? we have to get the right idea so i'd like to explore this statement this verse and it will be alluding to the story uh and i'm going to finish by ways that we might misunderstand the story or this verse what's being said here um a few months ago when I, before i left the uk i heard a story i read this story in one book that was written by one swami in another tradition um and i was a little shocked at what he thought the moral of the story was so many stories have a moral a meaning you probably know the story but i'll try to tell it as best i can there was once a king who was looking out of his palace and he saw that the lake was kind of muddy and the water was dirty he didn't like this he had some aesthetic taste um so he ordered all the businessmen some say all the citizens but the, the story i heard all the businessmen tonight you must come with one pitcher of milk and put it into the lake he was thinking in this way i will have a beautiful white lake instead of this muddy brown color it will be beautiful and white so all the citizens agreed <clears throat> next morning he looked out of his palace window after going to mangalati and he saw expecting to see this wonderful white lake instead it was the same brown muddy color because everyone he made some inquiries and everyone had thought there's going to be lots of people thousands of people will come i don't really want to donate a pitcher of milk i'll just put some water in there and no one will notice <laughs> the problem was that everyone was thinking the same thing <laughs> what's the moral of the story has anyone got any ideas what the moral of the story is i had an idea what the moral was kora hari prabhu you have a ah huh? you just arrived okay i i <laughs> i'm sorry oh you didn't hear the story i i beg your pardon anyway i assumed that the moral of the story was uh that if we think we can get away with cheating if no one's going to catch us then we will cheat sometimes they say that this person was punished not because he broke the law but because he got caught <laughs> i thought it was about having integrity <clears throat> hmm that we have certain values and we follow those values hmm? so everyone was cheating yeah i think here i mean cheating goes on everywhere and i don't want to focus on india that's not my business but i think here also there's some problems with with the milk yeah yeah i mean even if they brought the milk it would have been half water anyway <laughs> that happens sometimes there is some yeah many times even the synthetic milk i read somewhere made from detergent and oil or something <clears throat> very purifying 
The point is, when I read this book, the moral given by this guru, and I was shocked, is that uh, great minds think alike. Great minds think alike was the moral of this story. So all these businessmen, they have great minds, they manage to cheat, <laughs> and therefore they're great. Hmm? There are certain cultures where they, they, have, they have a word for it. I think there are certain countries where they have a word for this, where if you can get away with something, it's kind of, kind of cool. They have other words for it. This is not the standard of morality. I'm using this story just to show we need to really understand Shastra and not misinterpret. In fact, in the 12th canto of the uh, Bhagavatam, there is a wonderful description of Kali Yuga. And many of the symptoms of this age are described. Satchatve dashtam eva hi. This is one injunction here. If you are audacious, you will be considered truthful or moral. So this audacity is considered to be the sign of a moral person. So we tend to think that actually if we cheat, then we're intelligent or we're moral. This is a good thing to do. Yeah, this, this is sensible. If you get the opportunity, you do it. Uh, this, is, this is not really... I was shocked, actually, that, that this was written by a leading guru in, in another tradition. Um, so this verse needs to be understood properly. So let's explore this verse, because it's easy to get the wrong idea from this verse. Hmm? Sneha. I think that's a common name here in, in... Yeah? I think some of your Bollywood stars are called Sneha, even. Affection. <laughs> Yeah, sneha, affection. Um, it also means oily or sticky. You tell me, you know better than I do. Yeah, yeah, oily. And it also means adhesive, yeah, like a glue. So uh, sometimes, uh, so this is about attachment, getting stuck. By the way, if anyone's chanting their rounds, could they either decide whether you're chanting your rounds or listening? Please, it's not good to chant, pay attention to your rounds, or l please listen to Bhagavatam. Thank you. So this attachment, uh, I was thinking of superglue. I don't know whether you've had the experience of using superglue and sticking your fingers together. Who's had that experience? Oh, half of us. <laughs> and sometimes you pull it apart and you, you lose part of your finger. <laughs> Similarly, you hear people say when they lose a loved one, I've lost part of myself. A part of myself has died. Yeah? Do you hear that sometimes in India also? Or when Gandhi died, Nehru said, a light has gone out on the world. And so we, when, we, when we become attached to someone, we feel great pain at that separation. So it's recommended here, ati shneha, don't get excessive attachment. We feel that pain uh, when we're wrenched from someone or even something we love. Hmm? It can be something even quite small. Earlier this week, one of my curtains got marked in the laundry or gray marks of it. And my mind was thinking, oh, my court kurta is marked. Vasangsi jinani yitavi chaya. We think that the self, this body is the self. We start to identify even with the clothes we wear, and that analogy is given. This is somehow me. So just a little something, Srila Prabhupada mentions, even as a sannyasi, we have few possessions, but we can become attached to them. This is the problem, this is the purport of this verse, that this attachment, and actually in ISKCON, that word attachment is kind of taken on a bit of a life as, of its own. We understand the importance of not being attached. You may hear devotees occasionally say to you, 
Prabhu, I'm not attached. <laughs> when something happened, of course, the body language and tone of voice suggest perhaps there is a little bit of attachment. <laughs> But let's explore this a little bit. Um, it is so painful to lose people we love, yeah, particularly people. Um, But what is our, what is our, <laughs> what we could explore is what is our, therefore, uh, attitude, what is the correct attitude towards sneha or affection? It's a fact, we suffer. I remember meeting in, uh, I was in Watford in, near Bhaktivedantamara in the UK and I was chanting my rounds in a graveyard It's a good place to chant one's rounds. One certainly kind of gets some understanding of the temporary nature of this material world, yeah? Here in, in the West, we bury the dead, of course. Um, maybe they're not considered very auspicious places, um, but they're good for chanting. <laughs> one can read all the names and the dates and so on, and even if one mind, one's mind wonders as one's doing one's japa, one gets some understanding of the temporary nature, the transience of this world. Um, and I met one gentleman whose wife had just died, and he was telling me how he, was, he felt great separation, and he was telling me he couldn't find anything in the house. He didn't know what was in the kitchen. <laughs> His wife had been looking after him. So one could see, this is here, it's mentioned this is foolishness. And yet, in my heart, I didn't want to condemn the man for his affection. Hmm? I was wondering, should I condemn him for his affection? Is this affection bad or is affection good? It is foolish. It's mentioned here very, very clearly. Um, uh, it, it causes suffering. In fact, the word used here, I think, is cripple-minded, dina dihi. Yeah, cripple-minded, that one is, somehow the mind becomes crippled, it's not functioning properly, it, it can't, cannot work properly. Um, it's the wrong understanding that we're this body, yeah? Very easy, isn't it, to preach that, that we're not the body. By the way, this is so important in our um, spiritual life. One of the features of ISKCON is that an international movement based on the understanding of the jivatma. If we ever start to think in terms of body, if we differentiate excessively men, women, Indian, Western, and so on, then we've, we've lost that understanding. Hmm? Very, very important, the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita This is the na tweva hung ja tu na shang na tweng ni me jin adipa na chayva ba bhavishama. What's the last verse? Swami. Takpara. Yes. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all of these kings and soldiers, nor in the future shall any of us assembled here cease to be. Very important. We must, we must remember that always. So this attachment to the body is the cause of distress. I don't think that there's any argument that when we have a body, <laughs> we feel distress. It, it, it's really hard to argue that this world is a fantastic place. Uh, I think everyone at some stage will have experienced some kind of distress physically from the mind and the body. Yeah. It's kind of hard to argue. And then that's is extended to others. Yasyatma bodhi kunupe trudatu ke svadi kalitradishi bomya idyadi. Yatirtha bodhi salile nakari chit janishva bigesu saeva gokarha. This is a, a verse that explains, and it explains not only how being attached to this body is a problem, when we start to think, I, I am this body, this is me. But then we extend that to other things. I've already mentioned my clothes, my co right? I'm extending that. As a, hu a human being who identifies with this body made of three elements, 
with his self who considers the byproducts of the body to be his kinsmen. So the children come from the two bodies. It comes from the lady, provides the mother, provides the ovum, the egg. The uh, male provides the seed, the bija. And then the body comes. It's developed in the womb of the mother. And then he considers the byproduct of the body to be his kinsman. This is my mother. This is my father. Hmm? And Arjuna's dilemma in the Bhagavad Gita was the same. He was thinking, these are my kinsmen. I also read a story when I was at school. I was maybe 15 or 16 years old. It, w it was a war story, Second World War, because I was born in 1952. And it was about the Air Force. Do you have an Air Force in, here in India? You, have, you do? Okay, okay, good. I'm sure you're very proud of your Air Force. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to doubt that you've got one. Um, you've got an Air Force. So in the Air Force in the Second World War, Gora Hari, you're from Germany. So we were fighting these gentlemen over in Germany. Um, <laughs> we had certain names for them. They had names for us. Uh, um, but there was one story of one pilot, fighter pilot, during the Battle of Britain, who had an English father, but a German mother. <laughs> And he knew that one of his relatives was fighting on the opposite side. And in this store, he, he, he met him in the skies. He came face. So normally, our kinsmen are on the same side. But both in the Bhagavad Gita and in this story, the kinsman is on the opposite side. Therefore, Arjuna's identification with the body was being questioned. Hmm? So we think these people are my kinsmen who considers the land of birth worshipable. So we think uh, we have songs to glorify uh, the land of our birth. Yeah. Bande Mataram, I think. You have some song also, Mother India. So one needs to think a little bit. You worship your land. I worship my land. You think your land is the greatest. I think my land is the greatest. We can't both be right. <laughs> it's foolish. But what happens if I'm born? Sometimes it happens. You read stories. Occasionally on a flight, the flight attendants have to call for a nurse because a lady gives birth on a flight, an Air India flight. And they're on the way from London Heathrow to Mumbai. Uh, the child is born somewhere over Afghanistan. What is its? <laughs> it, you see, it, it's, it's more or less arbitrary. It's more or less arbitrary. And then, one goes on pilgrimage to a place that's distant. Yeah? So if you want to go to pilgrimage, it's got to be somewhere else. Even if you live in Brindavan, you have to go somewhere else for pilgrimage. Yeah? Yeah. So this is... They're compared to an ass or a cow. So this is very strong. This behavior, by the way, when the Shastra says an ass or a cow, it's not just being per, per, pejorative, like we may call someone, you dog. Or, or, I, I hope not, but we might do it. No, it, there's, there's meaning there. Um, particularly the ass is considered foolish, even amongst the animals. Yeah? Even the animals consider the ass to be the village idiot. Yeah? And the cow, the cow is given as an example because sometimes when the calf is born, it'll be stillborn, it'll be dead. And the farmer may stuff the calf, bring it to the cow, so that the cow licks its calf, who's dead, and gives milk. He wants to get the milk. So this is the analogy. So really the idea is that if, we're not, if we don't understand that we're not this body, then we're not on the level of a human being yet. Hmm? That human life is meant for that. So this is sneha, affection. Even cats and dogs have affection. Yeah? If you notice, dogs are also affectionate. Cows are affectionate. Yeah? And human beings often develop affection for animals. Yeah? 
here in India, not so many keep dogs. Oh, it's becoming a little popular now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's affection there. Uh, but what is that affection? Yeah. Th that is the question. We finish at quarter past. Is that right? Quart or nine. Do we finish at nine or quarter past nine? Quarter past. I'll leave time for some questions and answers. So the solution is to be looked at. Um, The real question here, is affection wrong? Hmm? And uh, what is the role of affection? How do we respond to that, this? I'm going to skip a little here, actually. Um, I'm going to actually run through to a few of the problems we could have here. I've listed a few. First is we can try and become detached artificially. Srila Prabhupada says, and I, I don't have the reference, but I can find it for you. If one tries to become detached, he will go mad. It's not possible to be detached. Attachment is the sign of the living being. Affection is the sign of the living being. It's not that affection comes from the body or even desire comes from the body. They appear to, right? It's based on the body, but the desire itself, affection itself, comes from the soul. Pleasure comes from the soul. At the moment, pleasure is connected to the body. So that if you give me some pleasure, Gora Hari, then I'm your friend. But if you invade Poland, you're my enemy. <laughs> Sorry, to use the example. <laughs> Friends and enemies. Yeah? Uh, so it's not that actually affection is wrong. The, other, the second mistake is to become detached from doing our duty. We should never be detached from doing our duty. The third is never to become detached from morality. Sometimes there's a tendency as a devotee to think that we're above morality. But Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur says very clearly that a man who is hostile to or fallen from morality can never be a spiritual person. And we need to be very, very careful about duty and, and giving up our duty. That is not usually detachment. It's usually a sign of attachment. Fourthly, we become attached to being detached. We become attached to the idea of being detached. Who is the person, which Leela is there, that shows that we should not become attached to being detached. Does anyone know the, the Leela in Krishna book or in the Bhagavatam? Gora Hari. Yeah, Sudama Vipra. Yeah. We may consider it a good story if we're a poor Brahmin and we want a little more money, a little more wealth. But the point of the story isn't. Of course, Sudama and Krishna were very close. They were together in the Gorakha and so on. But the, the highest meaning, the most esoteric meaning, is that actually Sudama Brahman was a little attached still to being detached. He was thinking, I'm a detached Brahman. And so he gave him all this wealth to actually remove his attachment to being detached. I was wondering if Krishna might do the same to me. <laughs> But this is a challenge. We, become, we think that this external renunciation is, we're attached to that somehow or other. Fifth mistake is we condemn those who are attached. We condemn affection. We even sometimes condemn wealth, beauty, 
learning and good birth. And they can indeed be obstacles on the path back to Godhead. But do we condemn them? Those opulences come from the Supreme Lord, Bhagavan. He is the possessor of all wealth. What are you going to do when you meet the goddess of fortune? If you have the opportunity. We cannot condemn wealth. This is a mistake. Sixth, we become cynical or angry in the name of being realistic. This is the real challenge. When we get hurt in our relationships, we can become hard-hearted and cynical. Hmm? There's a song I know from my youth. All romantics, romantics, do we have any romantics here? Meet the same fate, cynical and drunk and boring someone in some dark cafe. So there's two responses. It's wrong to try to enjoy this world, wrong in the sense that it brings suffering and it's based on the body. But this idea of actually then becoming cynical and hard-hearted will not work. Klesho dikitarastasham of yakta shakta chetasam. That path of artificial renunciation is very difficult, very painful for the heart. It will not work. I've put number seven, becoming hard-hearted. It is not useful to become hard-hearted. A devotee is soft-hearted, actually. Not sentimental and attached, but soft-hearted. And the heart, I think in the nectar of devotion, is compared to different substances, precious substances. Um, Bhakti Chiruswami, His Holiness Bhakti Chiruswami said, we should try and make our heart like butter. And then Krishna will steal our heart. <laughs> Butter is soft, yeah. unless you freeze it. So soft-hearted. Finally, the, the other mistake is to become detached from the suffering of others. We should never be detached from others' suffering. Hmm? We should not simply think, it is their karma. Let them get on with it. That is not a Vaishnav or Vaishnavi opinion. We must have compassion. Even though that suffering may be due, our suffering is due to our past mistakes, their suffering is due to their mistakes, still we have compassion. I'll read from the Nectar of Devotion. The ne and this is from the preface. The Nectar of Devotion is not presented to condemn any way of materialistic life, but the attempt is to give information to religionists, philosophers, and people in general how to love Krishna. One may live without material discomfiture, but at the same time, he should learn the art of loving Krishna. At the present moment, we are inventing so many ways to utilize the propensity to love but factually, we are missing the real point, Krishna. We're watering all parts of the tree, but missing the tree's root. We are trying to keep our body fit by all means. And it'll, it'll never work. But we are neglecting to supply foodstuffs to the stomach. Missing Krishna means missing oneself also. So one should be, in a sense, one should be self-interested. We should be self-interested. It is mentioned in Shastra that the living being becomes envious of his own self. He likes suffering. He thinks this is good. I will give you an example. I, was re I recently had the pleasure, and it was a pleasure, of being at the Bhaktivedanta Hospital. It was wonderful to have professionals, experts, who are also devotees. As I was going for an operation, they put me in a wheelchair. And someone was pushing me through the hospital in the wheelchair. And as I was being pushed, this surge of pride came into my heart. Just see, everyone else is working, uh, walking, and I'm being pushed. I have my own chauffeur. <laughs> and immediately I thought, this is perverse. I'm enjoying something, 
that's connected to being sick. Hmm? <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> yeah? Uh, I had an operation on my eye, and I, rec I remembered that in, when I had my first glasses in 1986, I got my first glasses. Uh, and then when I got back to the temple, immediately someone met me and said, Rasa Mandala, those are nice glasses. And I thought, oh, this is very nice. <laughs> but again, <laughs> I've got some problem with my eyes. <laughs> How can the glasses be nice? <laughs> so similarly, we're thinking the body is nice, but it's a disease. Bhava rogue, as compared to, uh, we often compare the process of spiritual life to healing. Because we have a disease, we're in a diseased condition. So this is, this is the condition we're in. But it's important to remember that even though this story we're going to hear is very cutting, it's very clear about the pain we will experience. And it, it hits hard, this story. And it's meant to. But we must remember, we are not con when we preach, hear the Lord out of affection for the soul, is always giving us direction. That's his affection. He's there residing in the heart. And we know that as human beings because we hear that conscience. He's telling us, Rasa Mandala, don't eat this fifth gulab jamun. It won't be good for you. You have experience like that? We do something and the Lord is telling us, or at least we, th we think we're not sure sometimes. But the Lord will give us direction. He's in the heart. Ishvara Sava Bhutani. He's situated in the heart. He's, he's giving us direction out of affection. I'm, I, really to meditate on this, we think how stubborn we must be. Krishna is all powerful. His Suridam Sava Bhutanam. Everything that happens to us is for our good. There is karma, but it's also mercy. How stubborn we must be that we're not listening. We reject that. So this affection is there. So affection is part of life. It's a part of the self. We have that natural affection for Krishna. But another mistake we can make is to think I have affection just for Krishna. That is Kanishta Radhikari. Hmm? We must also have affection for the Vaishnavas and serve the Vaishnavas because by serving the Vaishnavas, one gets that affection for Krishna. By serving the Vaishnavas, one gains affinity for the messages of Vasudev. Hmm? Very important that we serve the Vaishnavas and we develop love for the Vaishnavas. Even you have a fam family member, husband and wife, love your family members. Love your children. Of course, sometimes we can love in the wrong way for the wrong reason. That's possible. But still, we should not think that this affection for the Vaishnavas is wrong. Hmm? This will actually... Mukta dwaram apavritam. Every learned man knows that attachment for the material... This is from the Bhagavatam. I've forgotten all the Sanskrit. Kovido. The learned man knows that actually attachment is the cause of suffering. However, when such attachment is transferred to the self-realized Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis, Muktadwaram Apavritam, the gates of liberation are open to us. And another element mentioned in this verse, there are three things. Nama Ruchi, our love for the holy name, our taste for the holy name. Vaishnav Seva, our love for the Vaishnav is shown through service. And Jiva Doya, compassion for the, uh, the fallen souls. Of course, uh, we, we ourselves don't think ourselves to be Vaishnavas. Vaishnav tends to think, I'm al already fallen. So let me, but I've got, some, by the grace of Krishna, by the grace of my spiritual master, I've got something, something valuable. Let me share that with others. Therefore, we, we must also have affection. Don't think that this affection is wrong, this love is wrong. It is the highest virtue. And we must somehow try and develop that 
love in our hearts for others. Please don't become cynical towards the world or to others or hard-hearted. The world is a place of suffering. It is hard to go through our entire life and not give up on life, isn't it, in Kali Yuga? Something is going to spoil our experience. We come into this world with dreams and some, our dreams are often shattered. Yeah? The poets, they sing about this. Yeah? But do not become hard-hearted. We should try to keep that warmth of heart, that affection for Krishna, affection for the Vaishnavas, and the, also that compassion and affection for the innocent, not for the envious. The envious we keep away from. So this is perhaps a, a, some lesson we can learn from this. Um, I've been here in Mumbai for a while. I'm leaving in two, a couple of days. I'd just like to thank you for your hospitality. I, I feel that here in Chaupati, in uh, Mira Road, and in um, the Eco Village, the devotee care, the hospitality is exemplary. And even though uh, I'm hard-hearted, it softens my heart. <laughs> so thank you for your service. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and His Holiness Radhana Swami. Are there any questions or comments? Gora Hari Prabhu. And I'm sorry about my comments about the Germans. <laughs> Oh. Of course. Small question you mentioned about soft hearted mm. but not sentimental. Yes. Can, can you uh, show where is the limit or how to define? Yes. The, the whole Bhagavad Gita is a tension between karma, jnana, and bhakti. Or, in a sense, it's a tension between karma yoga is about accepting the world, it's world affirming karma yoga. It's not just a particular tradition here in India. It's the, propensity, it's the propensity of the soul to enjoy. It kind of, but it's world affirming. It's trying to enjoy through ritual, selfless activity indeed, to go usually to the heavenly planets. Jnana yoga and astanga yoga are about rejecting the world. So it's, this is the other propensity the human being has. The human being, we want to be happy. We come into the world, we want enjoyment. Ananda Moya Biasa, there's nothing wrong with that, but we're enjoying in the wrong way. Then we see, ah, I'm going to die. So intelligence comes in. Bhakti allows us to keep the sneha, the affection and the enjoyment, but not to regress back into karma yoga, but to progress beyond to bhakti. And that's very important to remember. We cannot remain either sentimental or a dry academic or jnani. Both are wrong. Therefore, we must develop bhakti vedanta. The heart, bhakti. Knowledge, vedanta. So we can't remain. We're usually on the sentimental level. We're born like that. We're born attached to the body. We have to go through that stage of jnana. Bahunam jnanvan ante. After many births, one who's developed jnana surrenders unto me, Krishna says. Don't think that we can avoid becoming thoughtful or developing knowledge or coming to the mode of goodness, sattva gun, pandita samadarshina, samadarshi. We must come to the mode of goodness. And we must become thoughtful. But beyond that, there is bhakti. And when the heart becomes, is given to the lotus feet of the Lord, then automatically jnana comes and detachment. Jnana and vairagya come automatically through that process. But there must be, for that knowledge to come, and for that detachment, there must be that surrender to Krishna. Does that answer your question? And you'll find that kind of tension goes through the whole Gita because Arjuna is asking in several places, beginning of the third chapter, beginning of the fifth chapter, beginning of the twelfth chapter, beginning of the eighteenth chapter, he's asking a little bit, you're telling me to get, you know, to fight, but isn't this kind of karma yoga? You're telling me to be intelligent, but isn't that regressing onto the level of karma yoga doing your duty? Krishna says, no, 
that is bhakti. So bhakti is a kind of synthesis of these two tendencies in the human being. And just to give you an example, um, a person may want, to, and it, it applies to everyone, a, a person wants, and this is good for our preaching, a person wants to enjoy smoking, yeah? but he understands, this is bad for me. So first he has the desire, secondly some intelligence. How does he overcome that? Or I want to lose weight, but I like to eat. So this is the human condition. Human beings have that. Animals don't have that. They don't have that intelligence. So how to deal with that intelligence, how to deal with that without condemning material desires or enjoyment. So there's a tension in the human form of life. We have to resolve that tension. And the way to do it is to develop love, bhakti. Does that answer your question to some degree? Thank you. It is quarter past nine. Do you have a, oh, you've taken prasadam already. Yeah, okay. I was going to. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go,